we'd come to a city ravaged by murderous conflict. Not long ago, the people who lived here were prospering, beneficiaries of the global economy. Then it all went wrong. Welcome to Ambon. This city used to be known as the Queen of the East. Today, it's better known as the Sarajevo of Asia. I was one of the first foreign TV journalists to reach Ambon. Indonesian Muslims and Christians are slaughtering each other every day. Forget talk of ancient religious hatreds. This is a new type of war, unleashed by the forces shaping our century. It's what happens when the heat of global competition tears a nation apart. The Jakarta skyline is testament to the fact that Indonesia embraced the big idea of our time, global capitalism. But three years ago, Asian currencies collapsed like dominoes. Global investors ran scared. The corrupt edifice of the Indonesian economy came crashing down, dragging the dictator Suharto with it. Indonesia's got a new president now. In fact, he's been in power for more than a year, but he's failed totally to unite this country and it's still racked by economic and political turbulence. This country of 220 million people is on a knife edge. There's anger and turmoil. The economic disaster has plunged 80 million Indonesians into poverty. Hardship fuels protest about everything from political corruption to the cost of living. Many Indonesians had hoped the guardians of the global economy would end the pain. But the International Monetary Fund imposed huge cuts in government spending that have hit the poor hardest. And the turmoil isn't confined to Jakarta. I set off to see someone who wanted to tell me about a city called Ambon. He'd said on the phone that what was going on there showed the true extent of Indonesia's meltdown. The man I'd come to meet had led a fact-finding mission to Ambon, the capital of the Indonesian Spice Islands, 1,300 miles east of Jakarta. Des Alwi showed us some film he'd taken. Muslims and Christians had been fighting throughout the city. Most Indonesians are Muslims, but unusually in Ambon, there's a large Christian community as well. Yeah, this is the worst case, Ambon is the worst case. Sometimes I wake up in the morning, and I think, that couldn't be. And it really, it is really. The problem was, even if we could get there, Des Alwi said Ambon was now so violent, we'd never get out of the airport. But the images of this distant, mysterious city strengthened our determination to get there. Just gone four o'clock in the morning and we're heading off to the military airport, uh, which is about uh, 15 kilometers outside Jakarta. The reason we're going is that we heard quite late last night that there's a military flight going out to Ambon, and uh, supposedly it's for journalists, so we're gonna have a go at getting onto it. If we went in with the military, they would be able to give us some protection. For people in Ambon, life sounded grim. Ambon is really the, the center of the firestorm that's enveloping Indonesia at the moment. Most people are trying to leave. We tried our best sales pitch, then waited. It's not looking so good. They seem to have changed their minds a bit about what, uh, what we should be doing. Um, 
They were going to take us in to at least uh, try getting access to the aircraft, but um, I think they're trying to find some plausible excuse to refuse us uh, access to the, to the plane to Ambon. They're saying that it's full of medical equipment and food and there's already 11 or 12 local journalists. Um, but I think basically they don't really want a foreign journalist on board. Later, we heard the army allowed the Indonesian reporters to stay in Ambon for just 90 minutes. We realized that to spend time in Ambon, we needed to get there by ourselves. And we needed safe passage from the warring communities. Some of Ambon's Christian leaders were visiting a church in Jakarta. After the service, I pulled them aside to talk over security in Ambon. They agreed to send word to their fighters that we were coming. They said they wanted their story told. Uh, yesterday I have contact with the friends in Ambon who will arrange uh, the security for uh, your visit in Ambon. Later, they invited me to a screening of a video just in from Ambon. The tape showed Christians and Muslims fighting. More than 4,000 people have died in the violence, including the man who took these pictures. According to the Christians, Muslim preachers helped incite this by blaming Indonesia's economic disaster on the Christian West. The church leaders said Ambon's Christians were the closest scapegoats to hand. Islamic warriors from all over Indonesia have arrived in Ambon. They call themselves Laskar Jihad, soldiers of the Holy War. Christians fear them. Laskar Jihad is right now running all over us. Yes, they are now in control in the Moluccas. The governor, the governor, the military commander is not in control anymore. What, anarchy? Anarchy, yes, that's right. We'd been promised safe passage from the Christians. Now, we needed the same from the Muslims. Outside the headquarters of Laskar Jihad, a man was collecting donations to finance the holy war. So Umar Jafar and uh, Ayub Shafruddin are taking me into the headquarters here. This is the Puskad Pusat Mobilizasi Jihad, which is um, the uh, headquarters of the um, Jihad mobilization. This is their this is where the, all the planning happens. And their aim is to purge the spice islands of Christians. They told me how they and their allies were doing. Uh, uh, okay, so Galila. Up, right, up here, Galila. Hmm. Up, up here, there were a lot of um, Christians massacred about uh, a couple of months ago, more than 101 village. And uh, at, at Alaska, do you see me? Do you know? Alaska, do you Mujahideen. 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 Local. 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 All right, so they're saying that the, the, those responsible for the massacre weren't, weren't actually the, the Laskar Jihad people, but um, <coughs> the local um, Islamic uh, Mujahideen militia. When we raised the question of safe passage, they suggested I meet the mastermind of the Jihad. Brigadier General Rustam Kastor was being treated for diabetes in a nearby hospital. Yeah. Christians say this retired soldier is up to his neck in Christian blood. This former aide to the disgraced dictator Suharto has written a bestseller about the Christian conspiracy. It's fired the minds of the Islamic warriors slicing up Christians in Ambon. <laughs> Ada konspirasi internasional yeah. dengan World Bank, dengan IMF, yeah. IMF yeah. ya. Mengapa? Uh, begini, bersamaan dengan itu, Indonesia... Indonesia's in the process of being Indonesia destroyed, he told me. Our economy's collapsed thanks to all this foreign meddling. Christians and their international co-conspirators like the IMF have created this chaos. The time has come for Islam to fight back. After the interview, Laskar Jihad contacted their fighters in Ambon and promised safe passage. Armed with our guarantees of protection, we headed into Ambon. 
A small commercial airliner was flying there, and we'd managed to get tickets. We expected to be met. The provincial governor had sent word that in our case he'd lift the ban on foreigners, and would even send soldiers to take us to his residence. The trouble is that the governor has not sent an armed escort for us, so we might have to try to pick up some security for ourselves now. But um, anyway, we'll play it by ear. A Christian minibus driver agreed to take us out of the airport. For most of the time, we were on his side of the lines. This is all Christian, yeah? Even so, he kept his foot down. Everyone here fears snipers. Our destination was a beach where he said we could catch a Christian speedboat across the bay to Ambon City. We were told that the speedboats could reach the Christian part of the city in 10 minutes. I think it's time to put on these massively heavy flag jackets because quite a few of the boats going across the bay have been attacked. And, um, well, it's just not worth the risk. Muslim and Christian speedboats often open fire on each other. Almost every day, snipers on the shore killed drivers and their passengers. Someone had died that very morning. So far, our driver had been lucky, and his luck continued to hold. We sped through no man's land towards the governor's residence. The locals call this Sniper Alley. Okay, we're right downtown now, and there's a, a Muslim area on one side of the road and a, and a Christian area on the other. And, um, you know, you can really get the sense of the communities living side by side. We reached the fortified hilltop house of the province's Muslim governor. <laughs> Saleh Latakonsina apologized for missing us at the airport and showed us around his home. 70 Christian refugees live in his garage. Their burned out houses litter the hillside below. The fighting's left close to half a million people homeless. Three people have just been killed in a mortar attack on the governor's house. Snipers regularly fire into his living room. The governor has declared a state of emergency. Indonesian troops are trying and failing to keep the two sides apart. He briefed us on the constantly shifting front lines. That's the harbour, which is over there, where the, um, where the big, long green roofs are on the yellow crane. Yeah. Nah, ini ini kira-kira yang sekarang ini yang jadi itu ini. This this one uh, apa? The borderline yeah. Ini. Okay. Nah, so yeah. any um hospital military? Yeah, yeah hospital Okay, military. so that's the military yeah. hospital and this is yeah. uh mm -hmm. this is Ambon's very own sniper alley. Messages went out to both sides. We were ready to enter the city. It's uh 10 past 11. And we're just in the throes of a very interesting manoeuvre here. We've uh, crossed from the Christian area, our hotel, um, just about uh, 500 yards in that direction. And we're in the middle of no man's land right now. And we're trying to cross into the Muslim area. And it's right here that we leave uh, Bertie, our driver from the uh, Christian side. And we hitch up once again with Reza, who's come across from the Muslim side. Uh, to, to meet us and to bring us back to Al Fatah. And the reason for this is that the, the, the Muslim community has suggested that there's something that we might like to come and see in their uh, part of town tonight. Okay? Okay. okay. It was well after curfew. That meant that as well as Muslim and Christian gunmen, Indonesian soldiers could shoot on sight. 
We're heading down what is normally Sniper Alley now, and Razor's had a word with the uh, commandos who man this area, so they know that we're coming, so we're safe to go through at the moment. And we're heading straight down to El Fata, which is about 500 meters down this road. We joined a procession of Ambons bereaved. There was to be a midnight vigil at the Jihad Cemetery. All around us were the graves of hundreds of fighters. Ambon's Muslim warlord led the prayers. <laughs> One hundred and ninety million Indonesians profess faith in Islam, making this the world's biggest Muslim country. All these Muslim men are praying that these heroes of Islam will be looked on kindly by, by Allah and that they will be able to sit next to him in paradise. This conservative religion was already disorientated by the dizzying modernization that followed the leap into the global economy. The economic collapse provoked a backlash that was waiting to happen. They see globalization as a new form of cultural and economic imperialism. They're making a stand, and Ambon is the front line. This is the gravesite of a young man shot dead by a Christian sniper as he prayed in a mosque. It's been absolutely amazing to witness this event tonight. This is uh, a group of men, some of whom are related to this uh, dead jihad warrior. His name is Harut. This is his brother over here. This is his uncle beside me here. The dead man's mother told me proudly her son's last words were Allahu Akbar, God is great. In Jakarta, we'd heard economists talk optimistically about life returning to normal. They don't talk about such things here. The Muslim wounded lie in an annex of Al Fata Mosque. When this city was divided, the Muslims got the port but had to forfeit the hospital. Many of the patients are children. Twelve year old Iskandar was shot in the leg as he ran away from a riot. In another corner, I met a boy infected by the hatred that's enveloped this city. His father, Ambara, was resigned as to how his only son ended up here. Oh, this is this is a sad story. This is um, this is Sano. He's he's just 14 years old, and uh, he says that about a month ago, um, they, they think they were living in a refugee camp, and he and some of his friends were making a homemade bomb, and uh, somehow, when they were turning the detonator, um, a spark ignited the TNT and um, bang, three of his friends were killed and um, berapa luka? Lapan, yeah? Eight were um, injured and he's been in here a month now and um, he got really bad um, burns on his legs. I asked Sano why he'd been making a bomb in the first place. He said, because we'd run out. His mother, Annie, took me to where he'd been making the bomb. Ambon's old government tourist office is home now to 1,200 Muslim refugees. Sano's family recently moved into a house whose owners have now fled. This is her house. This is the sort of Chinese Christian property which was uh, vacated and they moved into and they live on the third floor up here. 
I met up with Sano's father, Ambara, again. Over a fried banana breakfast, he said he had no expectation of peace. Then he told me that when a Christian mob attacked his Muslim neighborhood, Christian friends had sheltered his family. I asked Ambara to draw a map showing where his old house was. It was less than a couple of miles away, but it was impossible for Muslims to go there. We drove towards the Christian half of the city. This uh, sandbagging here is because uh, until just a few weeks ago, this was an incredibly dangerous area. About 20 people were shot dead right here. Because down there, it was uh, Muslim snipers, and uh, the Christians finally uh, managed to take the area, and there are Marines based in that building now, so they feel a lot safer. We began our search for the Christian man who'd saved Ambara's family when the Christian mobs attacked. Using his map, their old house was not hard to find. Some neighbors came to see what all the fuss was about. The first one I met turned out to be the man I was looking for. <laughs> August Tetelepta hadn't just rescued Ambara's family. He told me how, as the Christian mobs attacked, he'd shepherded 300 Muslims into this church. After three days, he persuaded local Christians to line the road so the Muslims could be safely evacuated. Not long after that, his own daughter had been killed, her throat slit by jihad fighters. He said he and his wife had been so proud of her, she'd been studying at university in Jakarta. Not far away, we encountered a local Christian warlord, Agus Watimena, and his bodyguards. Watimena claimed he had tens of thousands of men under arms. He and his men had just raided a police armory, yet he complained they still couldn't get enough guns. Okay, this is quite an interesting take. Um, we know from before that the Muslims are accusing the Christians of being supported by the Europeans, and uh, what Pa Agus is saying here is that um, he doesn't understand, he says it's really so difficult to get a hold of the guns, the automatic guns particularly, and he doesn't, he doesn't understand why the Europeans don't support the Christians, because they're Christians. And uh, he says, you know, Jesus comes from Europe, so why can't you guys help us? In Northern Ireland, he told me, they'd murdered each other for 30 years. And they've got the same God, he said. What hope have we got? <laughs> I climbed the hill to a wrecked village. The Muslims who'd lived here had been driven out by a Christian militia, but it could just as well have been the other way round. This says, uh, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Luke 23, 34. The forces that drive the global economy are making many people wealthy. But standing there in the debris of people's lives, my thoughts were of the havoc and misery those same forces can cause. The governor invited us to a commemoration by Muslim villagers of a battle against European colonialists. It's staged every three years. The men work themselves into a frenzy. They cover themselves with painful cuts, none quite deep enough to draw blood. 
was talking earlier to some of the village elders here, and they were explaining to me that this war dance is all about invincibility. That before these warriors would go into battle, they would cut themselves with swords and knives. And if they didn't bleed, it would mean that they're invincible. And I've just been to go and see some of these swords for myself, and they, they really are razor sharp. The governor portrayed it as harmless tradition, but we learned later that afterwards there was a killing spree in a nearby Christian village. There are many people who think that a globalized world of open markets and shared culture is inevitable, but globalization puts such pressure on some societies that they implode. Coca-Cola and the internet are yet to supplant older, darker forces.